It is <clears throat> indeed a pleasure to be here this morning to perhaps shed some light into a rather darkened area of knowledge for many, not only of you, but of the entire American population. <clears throat> it has not been until recently <clears throat> that people have realized the scope and extent of drug addiction and drug abuse in this country. As is per usual, people have allowed themselves to be deluded that the problem does not exist in wild abundance, that it only happens to the college kids and the people in the ghetto. But in recent years, research and many numerous publicized arrests have shown that drug addiction is not limited to college students or the people in the ghetto or to musicians, but in fact it is in part of American life that permeates into every aspect of our society, that it is in every economic class, that it is found in every racial group, that it is found in every occupational group, and that it is found in all phases of life. My own experiences in drugs came about after a period of intense depression. I was in the Air Force and received a, what I thought, very good education. And I came back ready to put my gifts to use, only to find out that after three years of preparation in the service, the first job I could get was washing pots and pans in a department store. This was depressing enough as it was. This combined with my mother's matriarchal feelings of pride and ambition for her only son who was not quite ready to cope and to accept the responsibility of being the head of the household and the fair-haired boy, led me to a phase of depression in which I sought to forget all about anything that I was even remotely supposed to be connected with. I did not start on drugs to prove anything to anybody, but rather to try to get myself together. The illogical reasoning being that if you stay so blind, you're not aware of it, then you can cope with it because it doesn't bother you any longer. However, it did not take me long to find out that this was not a good reason and that this was not a good escape mechanism, neither was it productive to me as an individual. Uh, for those of you who have not been around uh, drug addicts, uh, it's not very nice to see a 19-year-old girl who's been on um, junk for about eight months standing on a street corner at 4 o'clock in the afternoon nodding. It's also not nice to see kids who you went to school with who came from good families and good homes and had everything going for them going out of luck three and four times and they still don't get cured. It's not nice to see parents commit suicide when they find out that their children are on narcotics. Now is it nice to watch grown men standing in front of an all-night restaurant begging quarters so they can get some pair of work and shoot up because they haven't made enough money that day to get their shot. I was one of the lucky ones. There are a lot of my friends who I know who are not so lucky those that are still living. But I realized that after about a year on drugs that I was getting nowhere fast. I think the realization came when I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I had been wearing the same pants and shirt for about a month. And my uncle saw me, brought me home and threw me in his bathtub and called my mother. And she came over and started raising all kinds of sand with me, but I knew she didn't understand. But the mere fact that I was strung out and that people were still concerned enough about me to care caused me to want to do something about it. And so I was about to find myself a cheap hotel, locked myself in, and decided I was willing to go cold turkey until I got that monkey off my back. And then it took a lot of resolution not to get it back on. But so far, I am off and I don't think about going back on because I've got too much experience and I know what it can do. You know, it's an old illogical form of reasoning that if you go down into the places where addicts hang out, 
And you indiscriminately walk in armed with a billy club, a gun, and a police badge, and grab all of the junkies. And you grab all the cookies, and you grab all the luck, and you put them all in jail, you're going to stop all the drug problems. Not true. I have a buddy of mine who's dead now, who was in and out of luck a total of 12 times in 14 years. And he just got killed in an automobile accident. His father owned, was owner at the time of the largest funeral home in Columbus. The young man had everything he wanted. And there was another one at home just like him. What was their problem? It was a social problem. Perhaps they thought that they were being held back, that they were not able to perform the way that they should have been performing. Perhaps it was social pressure, uh, internal pressure from a discontented wife, from a social who couldn't quite understand their particular peculiarities of personality. But whatever the problem was, these people are never going to be any more good to themselves or to anybody else. There is a particular form of psychological, physical, and moral degradation that is seen in drug addiction that is not seen in alcoholism. You see, the alcoholic woman, all she wants is a drink. And while she might go through any number of means to get this drink, once she's got that drink, then she can sort of halfway straighten up. The same thing with an alcoholic man. But the drug addict, as soon as he gets one shot and gets himself halfway together, and you're on the mile for about a half an hour, 45 minutes, then you've got to get up and get out and hustle to buy that next shot. And this is a continuous hustle. Day in and day out, you're not concerned about food, you're not concerned about clothes. Only thing you worry about is getting yourself together so you can go out and face the world. And because in the latter stages of drug addiction, it costs a lot of bread. If you have a $50 a day habit, then you have to steal about three to three hundred seventy-five dollars worth of stuff because the fence is only going to give you one fix of the value of the stuff. Because he knows that you need the money for your fix, so therefore you're not going to argue him about the price. Because generally when you come in, you're broke, and you started to get uptight again, and you just want to get a shot. So you don't care what you get, just as long as you get some money. And when you want this money, you'll do anything for it. And this is the moral aspect of the picture that a lot of people don't see. A lot of people have the stereotyped notion of a drug addict as being someone who runs around, who uses all the latest slang expressions, who is up on all the latest records, and who in general fit the description known as cool. And most of the drug addicts I know are not that way. Most of them walk around day by day in the days, but they're never on the mouth. They're just thinking and meditating. And if you are uh, not aware of what I'm not, is if you get a certain joke and you start to feel good, it's customary for most addicts to just stand on the corner and just knock. And their eyes will be closed and they'll be just standing up there not, but they never, never sleep. They're just trying to catch up. In an all night restaurant, it's often a very tragic thing when Junkie has gotten his pop, his or her pop, and you come in, you see people sitting at the table with coffee. I'm, I know he's taking me three hours to drink one cup of coffee. Because you start to drink the coffee, and you start feeling good, you put it down and nod. Until somebody taps you on the shoulder, you're just there, you know? And uh, people come in and they laugh at you, you know, because, uh, you know, you're really putting on a show. Because you don't know what you're doing, you're just there. You know, and it's really an uh, embarrassing situation, but at the time, you're not aware of it. You know, because as far as you know, you're feeling good, you don't have any problems, you know. That is, so your nose starts running and you start scratching, and you know you got to get out and get yourself together. And um, it's a very, very sickening thing. A lot of people see um, drug addicts and they wonder why. And the main reason that an individual, from my experience and my knowledge, goes on drugs is because they don't feel they have any alternative. The constant pressures of everyday life 
are provided with the need for some sort of escape and some sort of relief. They're generally really tense or concerned and they just can't cope with it anymore. And so rather than try to just stay there and fight it, they retreat into the world of drugs. Some people retreat into alcohol and some retreat into drugs. But uh, around here, drug addiction is primarily an escape mechanism. We had a lot of great people who've been on drugs to try to escape. And once they straightened themselves up, they really became great people. And the one who's always been sort of an example to me is Malcolm X. Uh, here was a man who was at the bottom of the heap. And he picked himself up. And he became a man like he should have been. And a man like he could have been because he finally got the chance to be a man. Uh, from what I have experienced, and this is one thing that I don't believe a lot of people know. You hear about Son of Non, Narcotics Anonymous, and Lexington. The most effective drug drug program in the country is the Black Muslim Church. Black Muslims have almost 100% record of no regression and cures of drug addiction. Uh, in any big city in the country, wherever you see a junkie, you'll see four or five clean-shaven guys around and talking to them. And I've talked to some guys who are in the Muslims, who are on drugs, and with you, and they have no desire to go back. And uh, the reason that they achieve this is because they use a reverse psychology. They'll come along and they'll see them and say, man, brother, you're stringing yourself out. You're not like man's stuff. You know, why don't you get yourself together? And they keep on doing this, and they don't go back. The federal reformatory and Lex, I doubt it, Lex cures 10% of the people permanently. Because you can take away the physical desire for drugs, but until you remove the underlying pressures, the underlying social obligations, and change correctively the environment that the individual is in, you're not curing. You're just giving him a stopover from one habit to the next. A lot of people that I know go to Lex when the habit gets too big. If they get a $50 day habit, then they go to Lex and stay to a couple of months until it gets about down to $25 a day when they can have it. Then they sign themselves out. Because they know when they go back, they're going back into the same old thing that they came from. <coughs> it is not enough to come out with high polluting proposals, well, drug therapy, psychological rehabilitation, and all of this, if you put an individual back in the same environment. Uh, when I got out of drugs, I didn't go around the block for almost a year. I stayed in church. I wasn't seen by any of my friends. If I saw them, I was on the bus going one way while they were standing on the corner. Because I felt a little bit weak, and I didn't want to get back out there and get in that bag. Now when I go out, I see a lot of my buddies and my ex partners are finally trying to straighten themselves up. But it's going to take a lot of work. It's not going to take, um, as I saw last night on television, they were talking about jobs for kids. And they said our kids need jobs or something, not a whole lot of yak. And a junkie needs help. He doesn't need a whole lot of yak. And you don't help a man or a woman by looking at them and laughing at them. You help them by getting out there where they are and trying to leave and take them with you when you leave. And this is the thing that a lot of people don't want to do. As long as the junkie is coming to you in your office or in your church or in your house, then you can help. But when it comes to going in the college dives, going in the bars in the ghetto, I uh, know, you know, that's below some people. It's dirty out there, or uh, up there, wherever it is, and they don't really want to help. You know, it's nice to talk about a cocktail party, you know, but these people are not thinking about cocktail parties. They're too shattered morally, psychologically, physiologically, and economically to be worried about cocktail parties. And they're not worried about talk, and they're not worried about a whole lot of yak. 
I know when I came back to Columbus, I had it rough. People I used to run around with before I started on drugs didn't want to rob me anymore because I had that stigma. You know, Larry's been a junkie. We better not mess with anybody some of that stuff around him and we'll all get sent to the pen. And this is a kind of a chilling thing when you know that you and these people were tight two or three years ago and you walk down the street and speak and act like they ignored you. And uh, this kind of hurt me, but I realized that if I went back out there, that uh, where I would be. And it's a strange thing that I had the resolution to do it. I guess it was just because I was afraid. Because there are a lot of things that happen that people don't know about. Uh, you read about the people who get bumped off and gangland wars and this type of thing. But you never read about the addict who becomes so bothersome that somebody scrapes the bottle the acid off and gives it to him for heroin. He shoots pure sulfuric acid in his veins. This is a subtle way of getting rid of people. Uh, you never read about the guy who shoots so much that his veins collapse and when he's finally taken to the hospital for dehydration that he has to lay up there sometimes and just die because there's not a vein left that they can put the IV fluid in. Uh, you read the stylized accounts of the uh, glamorous musicians who have money to support, maybe a $50, $100 they have. But then you never realize that people like Billy Holiday, Yardbird Park, and others who had the monkey on their back died at their peak but they died over the hill because of drugs. Now, this all might sound very familiar, but realize this, that no one is immune to drug addiction. You have a whole lot of doctors in this country who stay more hopped up than half the patients that they treat. You have housewives who are dependent on drugs. They might not be junkies but they gotta have an amphetamine to get up in the morning, they gotta have a tranquilizer to cope with the kids, and they gotta have a sleeping pill to go to bed at night. And whether they wanna realize it or not, they're just as dependent on drugs as the cat that's out there on the corner mainlining. And this is becoming a symptom of something that's very wrong. And I don't know where it's wrong, but there are too many people nowadays that are taking the easy way out. They want to tune in, they want to turn on, they want to drop out. And we have to look at it from this, what is it that makes people want to do this? We didn't have a whole lot of drug addiction as it is now in the early part of, this, of the century. No, because you could go to the store and buy some medicine that had 98% alcohol in it or 50% opium and drink it. There was no licenses. There were no lot of addicts then. But the situation never has been as bad as it is now. You didn't have 13 and 14 year old kids actually strung out on junk. So this must mean that there's something wrong. And it's always easy to blame the typical boogeyman, the mafia, the pusher, the person's own weakness, marijuana, the availability of drugs, the desire to keep up with one's colleagues and to be hip. But I think that if we were to put our hands together into the still of an hour, that we still would not find the real reason for the cause of drug addiction. <coughs> Because it's caused by weakness in a person, we must look at what caused that weakness. You wouldn't be riding around on a tire that you knew was safe and all of a sudden had to blow out without wondering why it blew out. But it seems that some people can see a man, a woman on the street that's on junk and they say, well, you know, it's just another junkie. Like they say, it's just another wine or it's just another alcoholic. That's just another prostitute. And people never stop to wonder about why the tire blew out. And I think that we have to realize that 
the prevalence of drug abuse in our country now is everybody's responsibility. It's everybody's responsibility not just to cure drug addiction, but to try and stop it by finding out what makes people start in the first place to take drugs. If you've got a bunch of greasy rags in your closet and you wake, come home one day and your house is burned down because those rags exploded, it's a little bit too late to get those rags out of that closet. And I believe that with research and a lot of what's going on now, that we can find out some of the basic warning symptoms of a person that is inclined to take drugs. They've done a lot of work uh, with suicide. They now know certain forms of psychological behavior, certain forms of stress that start in an individual that can tell you whether this person is going to commit suicide, attempt to commit suicide, or what. So it should be feasible that people can do the same thing for narcotics addicts. Because a narcotics addict is going through hell. He doesn't have the best of everything, and he doesn't love anything. And he's perfectly happy to live life the way it is until he knows that somebody cares about it. I do not feel that it is out of common for anyone to follow the problem of drug addiction. I think that it's everyone's responsibility to fight it, to fight the dependency on it, and to fight the things which cause it. I was lucky. Some more people have been lucky. But every junkie you see that's not on a junkie anymore. There are a 10 or 20 who are and who's going to buy it. And they're not going to buy a pretty dirt and they're not going to buy in a nice place. They're going to buy in an island. As uh, in the case of Miss Crenshaw in New York, they're going to buy an apartment and get stuffed in the trunk of a car for two weeks because somebody's afraid to admit to somebody else that they were on drugs. And the same thing that happens to this individual can happen to you. And as I said before, no one is immune from drug addiction. Therefore, no one should be immune from caring about drug addiction and from caring about being involved in not only finding a cure, but intervening. I myself don't know of any sure cure for drug addiction, but a Building up within the individual of his resolve not to go back on drugs. A changing of the man's ideas and his environment and above all giving that individual a chance. You see, you can all it's almost easy to take a man or woman who's been on drugs for a year or three or four years, send them to the hospital for six months, they come back cured. Give them a job, and then they go back and say, well, I gave them a chance, it wasn't no good anyway. But it's going to take a lot more than that. It's going to take a concentrated effort at our levels, working among our people. In the past year, so I've been doing street work as a minister among some of our artists there in Columbus. And people are straightening up. And perhaps... This is one reason why I have more pressure now than I've ever had in my life. And I, I'm never worried about going back on drugs. Because I know that there are four or five of my partners that have straightened themselves up. And if I go back, that's going to be the whole ball game. But we find that most artists, when they become cured, they do go back. And this is what we need. We need more people who've never been addicts to go out there. I've never seen an addict yet who got cured and stayed away from the block. But I know that there are lots of them that have gone back to the block that haven't gone back on junk, that they're out there trying to help. And this is what is needed. The nightmare that a drug addict goes through, a not pleasant. Feeling like you got bugs crawling on you. 
you scratch and people looking at you and laugh. If you've really been strung out too long, you're, you're bound to get a dirty needle. When you shoot up, your arms are going to get sore, you're going to get sore, and your arms are going to start running. you got to wear a long sleeve shirt because you know people know you strung out and your shirt sticks to you and it gets hot and you start sweating. And doing all this, the bugs are crowding on you. It's not a very, very pleasant feeling. Yeah. But this is something that you can't get away from because this is all you know. And until you know something better, you're not going to get away from it. I wouldn't tell anyone to go on drugs. I wouldn't tell anyone even to try to find out what it is. Because the only real cure for it is not to stop. This is the only sure cure, is not to stop. Now, if a man is started, I believe that if you strengthen his resolve, and if you change his environment and make him think something of himself and give him a chance, that he probably won't go back. But there's already that unknown. That one individual that can mess up that neuro of rehabilitation and go back. I would advise every one of you not to start on drugs. Not for any reason. Now, I get into real hang-ups with people when I talk about drugs because I don't believe in this old thing that if you smoke marijuana, then you're automatically going to wind up an $80 a day habit. I don't believe this. I think it's wrong to smoke marijuana, just as it's wrong to smoke cigarettes because you get lung cancer and cut your life by 15 years. But I do not believe that smoking marijuana directly leads to drug addiction. I can't believe this. This is like saying that if someone eats a Hershey bar with an almond, then they're going to want to buy an almond plantation. It has no relevance at all. The uh, feeling that you get from marijuana is much less than you get from heroin or cocaine. And I feel that if somebody goes to marijuana to the higher stuff, it's because they wanted to be there all along and need an excuse. I know people who've been smoking marijuana for years and don't smoke cigarettes and don't drink, and they're not junkies and they still function perfectly well in society. And then I've never read except in cases where someone has used LSD. So people go out and do crazy things like killing a mother in law and driving down the highway at any mile without hitting a telegram pole, or wind up in the hospital for cirrhosis of the liver. I wouldn't advise anyone to smoke marijuana because you can get, you won't get addicted to it, but you might get to the point where you'll want it more and more. That's not an addiction. You know, to, to me, an addiction is, is when something gets to the point where you need it so bad you can't put it down. I've known very few people who smoked marijuana once and couldn't leave it alone for the rest of their life. And this is what I know. But as far as the high drugs are concerned, your opium, your cocaine, your heroin, and marijuana, and LSD, leave those things alone. Because those things are not good for you. They're not good for you physically. They're not good for you psychologically. They're not good for you morally. They're not good for you economically. When you're out there trying to make it, you know, uh, five dollars a week for a nickel bag of marijuana can take a pretty big chunk out of your budget, especially if you're only making about four or five hundred dollars a month. But the picture of drug addiction in this country is not a pretty. But it's not pretty in England, it's not pretty in China, it's not pretty anywhere where it's practiced. But it's going to continue until people make up in their minds that they're going to do something about it. And I believe that this is what this seminar is all about, to try to find ways to do something about it, to stop people from wanting to take it. And you're not going to scare people into not wanting to take drugs. Now, you can paint all of the dirty pictures that you want to about drug addiction and everything, but if someone makes it in the mind that they're going to do this, they're going to do it. So the main problem is to stop them from making up their mind to do it in the first place. Uh, the, I've heard many proposals 
all the way from Amsterdam on down to Joe the Junkie on the Cop. And I think that what we're going to need is we're going to need to establish a Federal Narcotics Commission. And this is not a punishment thing where, oh my goodness, I caught you with some works, come on, you're going to jail for five years. But a commission composed of people at our levels of life, in our professional levels, who will get together with the government officials from Lexington, who will evaluate records of people who are on narcotics, who will gather information from police departments and public health facilities across the country and start to set up some sort of a crop index on drug addiction. I think another thing is that the mandatory first jail term for possession of an addictive narcotic should be dropped. I think the first time that a person is caught with an addictive drug in their possession, they shouldn't be found in jail. I think rather that that person should be released to the hospital for a period of 18 months, the first 12 months, which would be spent in confinement of the hospital, treating physiologically and psychologically the symptoms of addiction. The next six months spent away from that hospital, working in a productive job in a different environment. And then this person should be followed up for a period of five years to make sure that they do not retrogress to have narcotics. I am not in favor, as we have in Ohio, of a 20 to life term for possession of a nickel bag of marijuana. I think that any individual who is over 21 years of age, who is caught in possession of marijuana, should be made to attend a compulsory six-month session on the evils of drug addiction, and that they must to be released from our custodial requirements, such as probation and things like this, that they must say that they never will use marijuana again after legalizing. And these are the two alternatives. I will wholeheartedly go against LSD. I've seen some people who tripped out on that stuff, and I wouldn't touch it with a 20-foot pole. I think LSD is more dangerous than her. At least when you're out H, you have to know what you're doing. You might be zonked out most of the time, but you can kind of float around a little haze in your little environment, you know, and you, you, know, you know what a bathroom is. And um, see, one thing about heroin, a lot of people have got drugs confused. Heroin is not a aggressive drug. It's not a converted drug. When you shoot H, you're going to stoop. You know, you're about to get up and punch nobody out. You're not going to break any windows, you know, because you're too high. There's enough you can do to move. You know, when, when you really have this thing, it's an it's hour you can do to move. You know. Now, I've seen people all over the do some weird things like jumping out of windows. I had a good friend of mine who was killed in California. Driving around the field, 80 miles an hour, and all of these side jump out of the car with a bird. He got me over by six cars. I don't see this type of thing at all. I don't see this FTP, any of this thing they're coming out with now, these psychedelic drugs. And if you want to get your mind expanded and go to school and get some books and get you a job you never had before and learn that. But I think at the same time, while we're condemning these drugs, that we shouldn't just go around. Why are so many young people on drugs? Why are so many young people trying LSD and STP? Could it be that there is something wrong somewhere that makes these kids want to do this to try to get away from it all? Um, there are a lot of things to consider. Could it be that uh, last year I heard this morning that there were 150,000 civilian casualties in Vietnam? In the first three months of this year, we've already surpassed that figure. And I saw some pictures this morning of little six, seven, eight, nine-year-old kids who were blinded by grenades, had their legs blown out, bodies covered with third-degree burns. I mean, could it be that something like this, you know? Or could it be that the guy down the street who is basically the same physiologically as you are, and you get around and you're not allowed to do some things together because he happens to go to the synagogue and you go to the church and you think this is a bunch of junk. Could this be some of the things that are causing our young people 
to turn to drugs. I can tell any young person that when you drop out of this system, whether you go out and drug and become a hippie or whether you decide to get you a cave and say, no, you go, then you're just helping to keep the thing going that has started you to doing this. Because you know, never change the direction of a car by jumping out when it's going the wrong way because it's going to keep on going the wrong way you get in there and try to change it. But I think that we're going to have to set up some priorities. And I think that right now in this country, that drug addiction and abuse is on a priority of internal security just as much as the war in Vietnam and the rebellions in our streets. And I feel that we must handle all these problems together. You know, because to me, I see too many young people, my age and younger, who are dropping out, who are turning to drugs because they feel that they have no alternative. If they're 18 and they don't have enough money to go to college, they can look five to going to Vietnam and coming home six months later in a steel box. If it's a girl and she drops out or she graduates from high school and she can't get a good paying job and maybe she wants to have everything like her rich friends did, and she just can't cope with it. But she's going to try drugs. So what we have is a problem that in comparison with everything. It's not enough to treat it medically by saying, I like you and I'm going to give you methadone, you're going to get off of that, and you're going to be real nice, and you're going to go out there and you're going to smile and say, look at me, I used to be on junk. Because if he gets back out there three weeks later and he's around the same type of filth he was in before, both human and physical, he's going to go right back on. So we have here a problem that in comparison to the whole spectrum, and even down the minister, I think the ministers have done a bad enough job of messing up the problem. Because you're not, you're not going to solve drug addiction by sitting in the pulpit on Sunday morning and banging your fists throwing the Bible on the pulpit and jumping up and down and yelling and screaming about all the poor that person is whipping our young kids. Because maybe the kids in your church haven't seen you do so good either. And maybe they think you're more messed up than the junkie. So these are the problems that we're going to have to face. I hope that in my remarks that I said something that perhaps illuminated you, made you a little bit more aware of the problem. Perhaps if I just caused you to think about it. And this is a problem that's all over our country. It's in every small town, it's in every city. It's just as much in Darien, Connecticut, as it is in Washington. It's just as much in Muncie as it is in Gross Point, Michigan. And I think we're going to have to really start taking a serious look at it. Thank you. ground rule for our discussion the fall would be for any of you at this time have a question you'd like to address to Reverend McCollum feel free to do so and we uh, I think we'll take our two people so that we can get the question directed down here and be understood we'll ask our two people to walk up and play Johnny Carson here for a few minutes While they're getting ready, and any questions you have, I think, uh, are in order, I'll turn the podium back over to Reverend McCullough here just briefly. I'd just like to mention we're coinciding our discussions this week with the summer school schedule, which means that in about uh, 10 minutes, we will take our break between classes, and we'll reconvene for the third period of the day. 10.50 for a second speaker. So we recognize that uh, most of you might have other classes that are not in attendance here, other classes to attend, and we're going to provide that, that schedule for that purpose. Any questions now or comment on the procedure that you'd like to have? I, I have one question to Reverend McCullough. Uh, that is when you talked about uh, 
I believe that you said that you were on drugs for approximately one year. Is that correct, sir? Right. Uh, then when you talk about a cure, did you go to one of the uh, federal institutions, one of the hospitals, or exactly how did you uh, relieve your problem, your own problem? Well, I got two of my buddies that were straight, rented a hotel room for a week, got one of them in the room with me until the other one to watch the door and the windows were barred and told them I'd let me out so I got it off. I went cold turkey. I see. In your experience with other drug addicts, did you find that most of them started on marijuana and then progressed to a stronger form of drug, or did they just start on the drug that they finished up with? Uh, there is really no set pattern of usage um, for a drug addict. Some started on marijuana, some just went on in, some started skin popping. Um, skin popping is when you take the drug, you know, put it in your vein, you put it, I guess you would call it subcutaneously and it's absorbed through your cells that way. Uh, there's really no uh, clear-cut thing. Uh, most of the people that I know that smoke marijuana did not go to the hard stuff. Yes, ma'am. Sir, uh, did you know the dangers involved in drug addiction when you started on drugs, and did you have any trouble pr procuring the drugs when you wanted to start? Uh, in answer to your question, yes, I knew the dangers. Uh, yes, I had trouble procuring it at first because, uh, you know, there's a little thing known as jail. And um, <laughs> you just don't go up to somebody and say, uh, I'm on the thing, man, let me have a bag of hearts or something like that. Because you're liable to be the undercover, man, because there are some federal agents that act more like junkies than some junkies. But, um, once it was known that I was on, then I didn't have any trouble. The only problem I had was getting the money to pay for it. Uh, sir, um, and I know in our town we're having a rather dramatic upsurge of it. How do we, how do we find these people that are thinking about it and try to recognize the symptoms before it actually comes about? Well, now, as I said before, uh, I'm not a sociologist or psychologist, but um, that by compiling information that you can determine the common denominators of human behavior that are present in drug addicts. And there you there are certain things to look for. Um, look, look for a cat who all of a sudden is uh, doing real good and it just becomes sort of blase, you know, it doesn't have any more interest, you know. Uh, I look for a girl who was always happy and laughing all of a sudden she becomes very introspective. Any uh, marked personality change. Some people uh, take drugs because they're shy and they want to lose their inhibitions. Some take them because they feel that they're too exuberant and they want to become. Uh, look for personality changes in people. Uh, look for sudden things in clothing, you know. Like uh, most people when they go into a hippie bag and they're not on drugs, you know, they still can get clean every now and then, you know. And um, when you're on hard drugs, people wear bright colors a lot. They wear shades all the time. Now, everybody wears shades and not a junkie. Some people have got weak eye muscles and have this. Um, loud colors, most of your um, junkies like loud colors. And uh, just general things like this, abnormal changes in behavior that, like you've known this person for maybe 10 or 20 years, they never did this, you know. And then you look around one day and they're doing it. These sort of things are things to look for. Well, the incident I had in mind was uh, last year at our high school, we had approximately 130 kids picked up by the police in one day. Uh, the, switch, the situation was they had found these, a group of young men had found a box full of uh, drugs that had been used for instruction, instructional purposes in a clinic that was established in an old school. And in one day, they had distributed these various pills and other items throughout the school. How can you explain how 130 kids in just, in just a relatively short time would be so willing to take something and they don't even know what it is. Well, this is, uh, asking me that is like asking me the same thing as when you were a little boy and your mother told you the stove was hot and not to touch it, why'd you touch it? It's normal human behavior to be curious about anything you don't know. I have an experience. Now, we're talking about addiction. Now, we're not talking about someone that tries something. There are a lot of people who take one drink of liquor and they never drink anymore because they get sick. There are a lot of people who try heroin 
and cocaine, instead of getting high, they get sick. A lot of people that smoke marijuana the first time and throw up. Uh, an incident like that, wherever you have an, uh, something like that with those type of predicated circumstances, it's not unusual. That's not saying all 130 of these kids are junk. This is what I don't dig about the narcotics laws now. You know, uh, you catch you one time in possession, you're marked for the rest of your life. You know, and you can't expect these people to make any valuable contrib contribution to society if they're branded from the start. It is the same thing with drug addiction as it is with uh, sexual promiscuity, as it is with homosexuality, as it is with a lot of other things. Just because somebody does something once doesn't mean that they're going to continue to establish this as a life pattern. And that's why in my speech I said that some of the penalties that we have now should be changed. Thank you. I was wondering in your work as associate minister if there's any, anything in a religious experience that helps these people to overcome this, this uh, habit. Well, the only thing that a religious experience can do for a real junkie is to provide him, um, in most of our churches, with some sort of spiritual relief. Now, the Pentecostal churches, uh, while I'm not concentrating, as I think, enough on drug addiction, have some cases. I know of a Pentecostal minister who was um, just automatically taken off the drugs when he joined the Pentecostal church and received the Holy Ghost. But um, as far as I know, the only religion that concentrates on drug addicts is black Muslims. Uh, the most junkies you find are very cynical about everything, church included. And, uh, you know, they've heard the whole bit before and they've seen the con man coming on Sunday with his nice shark skin suit and his new Cadillac, his alligator shoes, address the congregation, have these folks are scuffing for nickels and dimes and living on welfare. And, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can take a horse to the world, but you can't make him drink. And most junkies are very cynical. Uh, what drugs did you use when you were on drugs? Besides, you mentioned heroin and cocaine. Well, I used a little bit of everything, you know. May I ask, have you ever tried LSD? No, I haven't. I wouldn't. Okay. The same way I'm not going to take, um, guy, take a guy a shotgun and tell him not to lower, look down the barrel and pull the trigger. Do you feel that it would um, solve the problem or hinder the problem in the United States if they would legalize some drugs like they have done in England? Well, now you see, there again you're into another thing. Most drugs in this country are legal if you got enough money. Uh, what I mean by this is the individual that maybe comes from a poor family has to go out there and take a chance on going to the pusher, you know, to cop his junk. Well, the rich person can just go to his doctor and get a script written out. You know, it all depends on how much money you have. Uh, the only, and this is not a drug, the only thing that I would see that is narcotic that maybe should be legalized is marijuana. Because if they really start enforcing the law, we're not going to have no place to put the murder. They start putting everybody that smokes pot in jail. And we're not going to have a whole lot of our prominent leaders that are helping this country try to do something either if they start throwing everybody in jail that uses marijuana. Now, uh, as far as the hard drugs, I don't see legalizing. But now I, don't see, I don't see penalizing somebody for using them once. Did you start out on marijuana? No. Um, I had smoked since I was about 14. And, uh, you know, it wasn't really any big thing, you know. I was like drinking a beer to me. Uh, I started out because, uh, like I said, I was frustrated and I wanted to show everybody, you know, to tell them to go to hell. You know, so this is the best way to do it. You know, just get out there, you know, and cut yourself off from everybody else. And this was the personality defect I had in myself. I hadn't learned, I was spoiled. You know, if I didn't get my own way, then I forgot about it. This was the thing. I, I, I just can't see the correlation between starting out on marijuana and winding up on heroin. I just can't see that at all. Do you mean that you had smoked marijuana since you were 14? Right. 
Oh. I well, the south. It's very easy, you know. If you know what it looks like, just go into a field with some papers and roll up. Well, when you said in your talk about you would advise everybody to stay, not to start on drugs. I mean, you know, if you were telling somebody what your opinion was, right. well, did this did this include marijuana? This included marijuana too. Not, the, you don't start on um, anything that's going in the long run. Uh, maybe do something you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the same time, I have certain knowledge, you know, about the extent of marijuana. And I say I know a lot of people that <coughs> smoke it. You know, they're not addicted to it, and they function all right. But I wouldn't advise anybody to start on any form of drugs. Like I wouldn't advise you to take aspirin too much. Well, um, like, would you would you say a former drug addict would would there be a danger in in him going back? to something like marijuana? Would that, do you see what I mean? Like maybe an alcoholic can't even take, isn't supposedly take, supposed to take a drink, an arrested alcoholic. Would it work this way with a former drug addict? If he would go back to marijuana, would this be dangerous? Well, I don't know from a personal experience. I know some fellows who have been on junk who still smoke occasionally from what I hear, and I don't see them going back. There still doesn't seem to be any connection, in other words. No. To you, okay. Uh, the first time you took uh, drugs beyond marijuana, was the experience that you had a good one? I, mean, I got sick. But I felt good, but I got sick. I threw up all over the place. You felt good? Okay. I'm just trying to...